Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. I am Cynthia Cook. I'm the director of the Defense Initiatives Industrial Initiatives Group here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, and I'm very delighted to be introducing this panel today. The past two years dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic have been unprecedented in recent times, both for the impact of the pandemic, but also in the speed of the technological advances which were brought to bear to mount a response. Thinking back to the 1917 flu pandemic, there's no way we could have anticipated the speed at which we now make vaccines or the breadth of available diagnostic tools. It's truly been an amazing expansion of technology over the last 100 years. At the same time, a pandemic, if not this particular pandemic, was not really a true surprise. Experts have been talking about the potential for a pandemic for years, and in fact, governments have even developed plans and mechanisms ahead of time to address such an event. These past two years have seen these plans tested across the world. And we discussed this in our research and uh, we'll talk, be talking about that a bit today. So a couple of quick points to cover in this uh, before we get started. The case studies in this briefing were identified as key priority areas in the first workshop in this series. The whole of this project has included three workshops and two briefings over the last 10 months. And this can briefing encapsulate the work as a whole, its lessons learned, and it concludes our series. So before I do the introductions of our very distinguished panelists, I'd like to thank Ginko Battelle for making this project possible and really for making the contribution to the policy on this topic. So thank you. So um, now I have the pleasure of first introducing the very interesting uh, Dr. Tara O'Toole, who is a senior fellow and executive vice president at Incutel, where she bridges startups in the intelligence community, leading a strategic initiative to explore biological sciences and biotechnologies. Previously, Dr. O'Toole served as Undersecretary of Science and Technology at the Department of Homeland Security, where her portfolio included biodefense and a technology foraging initiative designed to scan the horizon of existing technologies. Prior to DHS, she, she served in the Clinton administration and also has founded and directed two university-based think tanks devoted to civilian biodefense. And finally, she was a professor of public health and the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Civilian Biodefense Studies and CEO and Director of the Center for Biosecurity of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Professor of Medicine and Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you for joining us, Dr. O'Toole. Uh, I'm also pleased to introduce Dr. Chris Fall, who is Vice President for Applied Sciences at the MITRE Corporation. Dr. Fall has also been the Director of the Department of Energy's Office of Science, which is the United States' largest supporter of basic research in the physical sciences and responsible for 10 of the Department of Energy's national laboratories. Dr. Fall was senior advisor to the Undersecretary for Energy, as well as acting director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency, Energy, ARPA-E, after holding a series of roles with the Office of Naval Research. He came to government service from academia where his research focus was on neurobiology and bioengineering. Dr. Fall earned a PhD in neuroscience and a BS in mechanical engineering from University of Virginia and an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. He is a uh, friend of CSIS because he is also one of our senior advisors. Uh, we welcome both our panelists and without further ado or commentary from me, open the discussion. If you have questions for our panelists, please drop them in the form on the event webpage. And now I will turn the moderating duties over to my colleague, Rose Butchert, who was the primary researcher and project leader for this effort. Over to you, Rose. 
Thank you so much, Cynthia. And thank you both uh, to both our panelists for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, without further ado, uh, Dr. O'Toole, the current moment in biosecurity has really been called a revolution. Why now? What makes this moment different than some of the challenges we faced even five or 10 years ago? There's lots of ways of defining a scientific revolution and some people doubt that they exist. But um, I would say on the basis of history, um, scientific revolutions, whether you're talking about uh, the period in the 14 to 1500s um, when Copernicus and others um, created an entirely new perspective on the physical world, or the more familiar revolution of the 1700s when uh, Newton and colleagues uh, used new tools, principally mathematics and measurements, to gain a different understanding of uh, how the physical world works, and onwards into the dawn of what we would call modern chemistry and medicine and so forth in the early 1800s. Um, so a scientific revolution, first of all, involves uh, getting a new, deeper, or different perspective on how the physical world operates. And I think another characteristic, particularly of um, this bio-revolution, um, is the appearance of new tools for interrogating and measuring and visualizing nature. Um, a British historian named Lisa Jardine, who actually just recently died, um, has written extensively on how <clears throat> the revolution of the eight, the scientific revolution of the 1800s, and these aren't points in time, these are fairly long periods when people changed their minds about how to think about the world, was characterized, for example, by the um, increased availability principally of microscopes and telescopes. Uh, you didn't have to be a king to own a telescope um, in the 1820s or so. Um, they were commercially available, um, as well as um, things like glass flasks that you could do experiments with. And I think what's happening uh, now in terms of the biorevolution is partly due to new tools. And one of those tools, if you'll allow me to call it that, is the digital revolution. It's the digitalization of data, the increasing computational power we have to analyze that data. And now, of course, we have um, machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms and whole new techniques um, for um, interrogating data. But we also have things like um, DNA sequencing machines, which in the last 50 years um, have gotten increasingly powerful, accurate, and cheaper. Um, we're not as fast or as accurate at synthesizing DNA, but we're getting there. And with the advent of CRISPR, of course, the kind of um, multi-purpose Swiss army knife gene editing tool. Um, we have new tools um, for, first of all, interrogating uh, gene sequences, um, and we have been doing so. The number of papers um, published in the scientific literature on CRISPR when it was first announced went from the double digits to five digits over a period of just a few years. So people are using these tools. And then there's things that we don't hear as much about like cryo-electron microscopy, which has allowed us a new way of seeing the actual molecular structure of living organisms without zapping them with radiation and wrecking half of them. So we have all, and that's just a short list, but we have an automation itself, the ability to do liquid pipetting in very large volumes allows you to create um, lots of data very fast. And the internet, of course, allows us to share it all over the world at the speed of light. So what all these tools have done, I think, is given us um, a much deeper understanding of how living organisms work. And as a consequence of that, our capacity to manipulate different parts, pieces, and functions of living organisms has also grown uh, greatly and um, is accelerating. 
So why don't I stop there? I can go on forever, but that's the nugget. Well, thank you. And I, I think you highlighted a lot of themes um, which, we, which we touch on in this brief, the data management and how uh, laboratory research has been able to push this field forward. But at the same time, Dr. Fall, even as we sit in this biosecurity revolution, even though biosecurity and biopreparedness very much been in the news for the last couple of years, um, we have to be prepared for it to eventually fade from the political spotlight. Um, certainly there's work being run, being done now, including the ambitious Apollo program for biodefense, which demonstrates how much momentum the current moment has for biosecurity. But how do we make programs like that resilient, even after COVID-19 sort of fades from the headlines? Um, well, right, and thank you. And again, thanks to, to Genko and Battelle and, and to CSIS uh, for, for keeping, on, as I said, an eye on the ball. Uh, this is incredibly important. Other organizations as well, CSR, your friends, um, uh, doing this. And just um, if, if you allow me uh, one second, I want to tack on to what, what Tara just said. Another of and she, she hinted at it, but let's be explicit. Um, another of the, the revolutions in biology is, is similar to the revolution that physics went through a long time ago. And that is the idea of scale, the idea of folks working together on large teams to solve problems, initially sequencing the genome, but now, uh, and this isn't a product placement, but through organizations like Ginkgo, manipulating at scale. So it's not just a cottage industry anymore. So it's a, you know, you can turn that very powerful tool and, and do a lot with it. And so this idea of infrastructure, uh, investing in infrastructure, investing in our own national laboratories that do not have these capabilities is largely in the private sector. Sequencing we do, you know, engineering we don't is important. And so, um, and, and to your point, you know, we're all, I think, uh, acknowledging and afraid of this COVID exhaustion. People are so tired of this. They don't want to hear it about it anymore. And they would like to put it behind. And so naturally, and all sorts of other folks, uh, sorry, topics are on the agenda. Um, you know, build back better for energy and social uh, issues, um, uh, uh, infrastructure and so forth, investments that are coming. And there's this dichotomy. We still have the public health organization telling us daily about COVID, but we're not talking about future investments. And so I'm very worried about falling off that cliff. Oh, it's behind us. We'll get to it next week. We've got these other prep pressing things to, to, to move forward on. And then it gets left behind as it has been left behind before uh, after a situation. So I don't know if Tara agrees with that, but um, I, I'm very concerned that we, we don't have that momentum uh, where it counts, which is uh, authorization and appropriation, despite all sorts of folks, not least CSIS, but these other organizations um, clamoring for the need to carry through with what we've learned, the lessons we've learned, the new structures that we've adapted to and making sure they continue uh, in the future. So I don't know, Tara, is that, is that a fair assessment? Or are you more yeah. optimistic? <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I'm really more optimistic than others, um, and I don't think I am here, but, <clears throat> you know, um, Senator Richard Burr, uh, who's been a champion of um, biodefense and biosecurity for decades now, really since <clears throat> 2001, when he and Senator Kennedy uh, worked on the first um, biodefense bills, uh, said the other day at the Bipartisan Biodefense Commission hearing, which was about Project Apollo, um, he was asked the same question, you know, how do we get this funded? How do we not go into a spend and neglect cycle? And he said um, he thought that the Congress would vote for a plan that they truly believe protected the American people. Um, but he thinks he's skeptical that all of these ideas and all this money that has been suggested isn't actually going to perform as promised. Um, and I think there's some truth to that. Um, I think um, there's a lot of consistency in the calls for what we should spend money on coming from the various think tanks and agencies and expert groups, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't seen a good plan for how we spend that money. 
Um, and in fact, one of the, I think, remarkable facts of this, if you want to call it a biorevolution or a pandemic in the midst of a biorevolution, um, is that it's not even clear which federal agency um, should be in charge um, right. of um, what has to be a public-private enterprise in partnership. Should it be HHS? There's an awful lot of bio they don't have anything to do with. Um, should it be commerce? Uh, they're the most experienced dealing with the private sector. I'm sure DOD thinks it should be DOD. They pretty much said as much. Um, but the fact that we aren't even organized to have, at this point, two years into a pandemic, a good plan of who does what to whom, how and how fast. That's right. Um, is a kind of disturbing marker. Right, where it's we really in, in, insightful and not, I, I think, you know, to the slight point you were going at, you know, we, I think we did have a lot of notional plans in place uh, pre-pandemic, they really weren't followed. I mean, we, we, we had to adapt and create all sorts of workarounds and new groups. And, you know, I was in the middle of it on the federal, sorry, not in the middle, but sort of one step removed. You know, one of these agencies that wasn't core like HHS, but was in a supporting role with the labs. And I couldn't figure out what was going on in terms of leadership and where we should be helping and so forth. You know, that the, the traffic control, mission control, you know, to, to, to uh, put the name to it that I think the White House is, is thinking about is so important. And uh, um, I, I, to your point, I don't think we're even there yet now, two years into this. Um, you know, I would also say that I think one of the big differences between this moment and World War II, when we marshaled the resources and the imagination to build industrial America, essentially, um, is the relationship between the government and the private sector. I think, and particularly in biology, you know, physics was born classified, as is often said. Um, the first big physics project was the uh, Manhattan Project. And um, most of the physicists in America were part of that project and grew up in that project. Um, biology really hasn't been connected to the government uh, beyond um, its dependence upon NIH grants to some extent. And the private sector aspects of biotechnology really are private. Um, and um, that lack of a network of relationships between um, the private sector, which is the source of most of the innovation in biotech, at least if we're talking about um, applications of biological knowledge and uh, people in government um, is a problem. And um, is a problem may be, maybe the wrong word, but it's a reality that makes it very difficult to construct um, a new framework for action. And if I could, could pull on that thread just a little bit, um, one of the particular challenges of this space is that a lot of the bioeconomy resides in small and mid-sized businesses, which are often just a challenge, face, face their own set of challenges in working with the federal government. And Dr. O'Toole, I know you, part of your work at InQtel is bridging the government and startups and these smaller businesses. Um, how, how can we overcome some of these challenges of working with small businesses? Are there things that other countries are doing that, that we should look at? Um, we should also always look at what other countries are doing. Um, there's no question that, um, well, there's no question in my mind uh, that the US is the innovation engine of the bio revolution. There are other countries with great strengths. The UK in particular comes to mind. Um, but we have tremendous research universities um, that are um, increasingly uh, using the venture capital um, ecosystem to forge um, businesses taking basic science findings into the real world to create products. That's a very hard chasm to cross. And particularly in biomed, it, co it costs a lot of money to do so. 
Um, no other country has the VC ecosystem we do. Um, so that's a big difference and an advantage. Um, small companies have a hard time plugging into government. Okay. Um, and the question I get asked the most is something along the lines of, we have a great product. Who do we talk to? And uh, the tempo of that question picked up during COVID. Everybody wanted to help. They had no idea where to take the product. And it's not very helpful to say, talk to BARDA. <laughs> you know, how do you do that exactly? Um, and how do you get to the head of the line? And how does poor BARDA, you know, weigh one idea against the other or one company with the same idea or similar ideas against the other? So we're not well set up. Uh, this is just another symptom, I think of uh, this gap between what the private sector could do and wants to do and what the government sees as needs doing. I mean, I think, I think the government, I think it's on the federal government to say, for example, um, we intend to develop um, countermeasures, diagnostics, therapeutics, and particularly vaccines against the following viruses. Um, and we are going to put the money necessary to uh, design the solution, to test the solution, and to pr prototype the solution over the next five years. And it has to be an amount of money that is consistent with the actual cost and the need to make profit. And it has to look a lot more like the DOD budget, or maybe one aircraft carrier in the DOD budget, and a lot less like what we pay NIH to do basic science research. I think if the federal government um, said that, the private sector would come. I think they would respond, but they haven't heard that. And in fact, when Dr. Landers talked at the Biodefense Commission, he's very articulate and um, even eloquent. And um, I agreed with absolutely everything he said. I think the whole room did in terms of the plan. Um, and um, he said, we're getting, you know, we know the private sector has to do this. We're getting ready to talk to them. Well, the private sector is getting pretty discouraged at this point. Okay. And truth be told, there's a limited number of ways wherein people in the federal sec sector, Chris knows this, can actually talk to people in the private sector, particularly about proprietary information. Um, so we have a long way to go. I think, you know, people are, I think we're aiming in the right direction, but we really have to pick up the pace and we have to get much more specific about the goals and the government's willingness to actually be realistic about what it will take to meet them. Um, and I, you know, I just add that, uh, you know, you look across all of these reports similar to what CSIS has, has uh, come to conclusions on, including the report, by, you know, by uh, my own company here, MITRE, and the supply chain is the bottom, you know, the common denominator across all of this is the biotech, biosecurity supply chain. And, you know, companies uh, it oftentimes just don't want to get, it's not just they're frustrated, they don't want to get entangled with the federal government. And VCs sometimes don't want to work with companies that are entangled with the federal government because of intellectual you know, uh, intellectual uh, property issues. And there are, you know, way, there are ways around this, but they're difficult, right? The, 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 you know, NASA has solved this through the Space Act, right? NASA is able to enter in to whatever arrangements make sense, not just for now, it's not about best value to the government, it's about mutual best value. It's about growing an industry like commercial space. And we haven't figured that out uh, in the rest of the government. But I will add, you know, Tara started talking about the Manhattan Project. That was all done by commercial companies. That was all under contract, you know, Dow Chemical and the big um, industrial uh, concerns made that happen on behalf of the government. It was a public-private partnership of the first order, you know, in a, in a very real sense, without a lot of, you know, and we're still paying to clean it up, but without a lot of rules, you know, involved, it was just go solve this problem. Uh, If I could 
I think that's a great point. And if I could pick up on it a little bit more, I know, as you mentioned earlier, you really saw this firsthand last year. Um, which, what are some of the mechanisms that really work well for government to public, uh, partner with industry and where there are gaps, which gaps do we need to move out on first? Well, I do think, I mean, this fundamental concept of best value to the government does not work when you're trying to build an industry and trying to promote technology, right? It's designed to buy things in the commercial sector at the lowest price, not let's nurture, right? And, and there's risk and, you know, for all the right reasons, there's risk uh, involved there. Um, so I do think, you know, and, and someone, there have been a number now of, of these uh, meta analyses that compare the cost to address COVID to the cost that would have been to prevent COVID. And it's what, 100x or something like, you know, I don't know what the estimates are, but bottom line is, you know, we're, we're um, uh, um, saving a, you know, saving a dollar to spend a billion or something, uh, however the, the thing goes. So um, I, I do think I do think that's a big issue, but the, you know where it came became obvious to me that we have uh, problems in terms of again this mission control and being able to respond uh, was when when the Department of Energy wanted to get into the fight on COVID, all the national labs wanted to do it, and we were not allowed to do it until the COVID Act, we, until we had the specific authorization and the appropriation to go do this work related to COVID. Literally, we were proscripted from getting involved in, uh, you know, direct work through the Department of Energy for, for, you know, using our science facilities and so forth. That's kind of, that's kind of, you know, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and I know that's a little bit more about the federal side than the private sector side, but golly, uh, you know, um, anyway, frustrations, lots of frustrations, lots of lessons learned to spin it positively. And uh, um, I, I think there's probably a lot more, you know, a lot more to come despite, despite the successes of, of the vaccines and so forth. You know, I think I agree with everything uh, Chris said. Um, I've experienced similar frustrations. Part of the problem is we're not thinking big enough. I mean, I'm all for acquisition reform, God knows, but everybody has been all for acquisition reform for 50 years, as far as I can tell. We haven't reformed yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but the, the, part of the problem here is um, tacking on to Burr's comment, we have to redefine what makes up national security, national power and economic yes. competitiveness, okay? National security now includes the ability to respond effectively to pandemics. National security now includes or should include um, in the real world, the capacity to get very, very active mitigating climate warming. Um, it's going to have to include um, our ability to build a bioeconomy because I think that economic competitiveness is going to depend hugely on that within 20 years. And so does China. Um, so there, th this, is a, um, this is a conceptual revolution, I think, in our notion of national security. It is not anymore about defending the borders of our land or our allies' lands from military attack. It's the need to reorganize to deal with these planetary issues that we've not had to deal with before and which in part are a consequence of our technology and our inability to be uh, forward thinking enough to realize that putting plutonium in the soils at Hanford was gonna cause a problem somewhere down the line. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, there's a lot at stake, but there's a lot of big pieces on the chessboard that need to move. And I think it starts with not just Senator so-and-so or Chairman so-and-so deciding they're gonna vote for this or that bill. I think there really has to be a, um, a mind shift in the way, not just the leaders of the country, but really the people of the country 
um, understand national security. I think it's happening. Unfortunately, it's happening after tornadoes and floods and hurricanes and terrible wildfires, et cetera, et cetera, are ravaging the land um, and having personal impacts on people. And if we wait until that happens um, on climate change effects much longer, we may not be able to reverse it. But biology, for example, is gonna be essential to dealing with climate change. We need to start engineering plants now so that we have enough food. We should engineer plants so that they take up carbonates and drive down the carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, we, we need to think uh, very much outside the tiny little box we've gotten ourselves into. Um, and we need everybody to help imagine this new world and frankly inject some hope in it. Um, because I think most people now, largely because of COVID, but also because of the political gridlock we're in, um, are feeling very despondent about the possibility of progress. And, you know, and we're just, uh, I, th I do think biosecurity is national security. Uh, it has to be uh, recognized that that increasingly is, but you know, we're just sort of talking about, uh, call it naturally occurring things. Obviously, there's the, you know, the, the more, um, you know, call it the ad adversarial relationships and, and folks intentionally making things. And you could argue, I think, that, you know, owning the frontier, you know, outperforming other uh, nations when it comes to engineering biology, really understanding that better is a strategic deterrent for that kind of eventuality if, if, if you know if other countries believe that we are so much better at engineering biology that they are that we can adapt and respond that is a strategic deterrent when it comes to you know that aspect of biodefense and it's you know fundamentally different from the oh we we sent something we try and figure out what it is and then come up with a countermeasure it really is you know owning the toolbox and and being able to engineer things routinely for the positive, you know, for the opportunity space, for the bioeconomy, for climate mitigation, for other things, but also uh, in response to, to um, engineered bio threats. Thank you. I think bio, biosecurity is absolutely part of national security. Um, and a reminder to our audience, um, you can submit questions for our panelists either through the chat um, or through the questions uh, submission form on the registration page it should be directly below the video you are watching. Um, and to pick up on, on what, some of what you've mentioned, uh, Dr. Atul, this isn't even the first time you've been at the forefront of a technology wave. Um, under your leadership, ST created uh, the Department of Homeland Security's first division of cybersecurity research, and you've helped forage for extant technologies that can really be quickly integrated into government. Um, what pieces of the chessboard, uh, to borrow your phrasing, do you think we need to move first to um, think about bioeconomy bio opportunities as well as the sort of threats and risks um, in order to sustain interest in this space when the threats are less urgent, when we don't all have a pandemic staring us in the face? Um, well, I think there's lots that we can do. Um, <clears throat> um, I think we can take a page from the era after Sputnik when we thought we were gonna be outcompeted um, in um, physics and engineering by the Soviet Union. And we launched the National Defense Education Act, <clears throat> which is why I went to medical school. I never would have gotten to medical school if they hadn't invented AP biology and chemistry and physics. Um, but they, they really did revamp, I think, from junior high on the public school curriculum for science. Uh, we need to do that. We need to go beyond that. I think P most PhD programs in biology are a little ridiculous at this point. Um, they're not affordable. Sorry, Chris, I know you have a PhD in biology. This is, I could say a lot about medical training too, but what I mean is they take too long and they cost too much. And uh, you don't get your money or your time's worth. And when you get out, you're then a postdoc for the next two to four to six years, um, earning very little. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, 
so we have to rethink um, our uh, talent pipeline. And um, I would try to move a lot of the people in that pipeline into the public sector. The public sector right now doesn't have enough people who are literate, let alone fluent in these new sciences. Um, you know, one of the consequences of the way the Atomic Energy Commission grew out of the Manhattan Project was that um, even in my day at DOE, uh, back in the 90s, every senator had their favorite physicist they would call and ask questions of when something came up. That kind of network, even that local intimate network, doesn't really exist between um, most people in government, particularly legislators and um, people in the scientific field. Um, I think we need to, as I said, um, um, do more in the arena of translation. We are the world's powerhouse in terms of basic research because of our about a trillion dollars invested in NIH since World War II, more than any other country has spent. Um, but we kind of dropped the ball when it came to translating that understanding of um, the phenomena of the natural world, mostly in biomed, as I said, into a useful product. We left that to the private sector, um, which turned out de facto to be big pharma um, and uh, small biotechs funded by venture capital. Now they've done a lot of good, okay? Um, but they have their own priorities in big pharma, mainly these days making money, meeting their quarterly expectations, and creating blockbusters that will be used by large numbers of people. The biotechs have their own, you know, uh, goals and problems. There's a lot of need between what the private sector is going to create on its own and what the government needs for national security. And it's in filling that gap that the public and the private sectors have to come together, which is why the government saying, okay, we've done the analysis, we need this, 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 and this, how are we gonna get there, okay, is so important. Um, and towards that end, I would spend money on what I call translational infrastructure. So for example, I would spend some of the money that was considered by Congress um, to build biofoundries in different regions of the United States where people in universities, people in small companies, even big companies could come together and figure out how do we do synthetic biology appropriately, safely, and at scale. Um, I would um, greatly upgrade GenBank um, so that it was easier to use, easier to get information in and out of, um, and more uh, useful to researchers, more secure, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there, was, there were very important sequences of COVID early in the outbreak that were removed from GenBank. The story behind that remains very puzzling, but um, it ought not to be possible to do that frankly, unless there's a clear error that is being fixed. So I would, I would spend money on infrastructure that would help everybody who's interested uh, from whatever sector get better at building bioproducts and not just biomedical products, but do that for industry, for production purposes. Biology will be the manufacturing platform of the century. Do it for agriculture and also do it for planetary health. Absolutely. I think um, actually that brings us to our next question, which is one of the conclusions of our brief was that biosecurity research in some ways needs to be um, a quote unquote peacetime activity that you can't just work on it when things are going wrong, but that many of the innovations that we drew on during COVID were things that had been in, in one phase of development or another um, for years, if not decades ahead of time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but um, if you look at something like mRNA vaccines, well, first, you know, that in some ways that can trace its heritage all the way back to CRISPR. Um, and even during decades. Back to SARS. Sorry? Never mind. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Along I didn't. Um, 
So I think uh, one of one of the questions that, that I had, and I'll direct it first to Dr. Fall, but, but please both of you jump in, um, is one of the many hats you've worn has been leading Department of Energy Labs um, who do this kind of um, research, including during the, the, the early days of COVID as we've touched on. Um, what are some of the things that the lab should really be working on developing and moving out on developing now? Right. Um, well, uh, just a couple of thoughts there. First of all, um, I do think it's important, you know, kind of segueing from what, what Tara said um, earlier, physics was born classified. You could almost say that biology is born countercultural <laughs> uh, in some sense. And so there is absolutely not the same willingness to be involved with the government, I think, generally speaking, lots of wonderful, you know, lots of exceptions there in the soft sciences, uh, you know, biological sciences, there is there is in physics and engineering for all sorts of reasons. And therefore, um, if we're talking about biosecurity, we really do need to have people in our national labs who are doing cutting edge bioengineering work. A, so that they can understand it, B, because the national labs do have this mission of creating and disseminating and, and commercializing technology, but C, because, you know, when, when things get, get you know, that's kind of where you want to have the BSL uh, uh, four labs, that's where you want to be able to do classified analysis if necessary. Folks are able in the national labs to bridge the opportunity space and the security space. And so we are woefully under resourced in people and facilities. We I got, you know, we got great sequencing, but that's not engineering biology. And so, um, you know, Tara was, was mentioning the kinds of tools and, you know, again, not a, not a product placement, but um, this is exactly what we're thinking about here at MITRE is this idea of a standardized reference foundry model that can be, so democratizing the foundries, if you will, um, not just in terms of capability, but also in terms of security. So, you know, you buy, you know, this suite of equipment, it'll have this capabilities and, you know, we can ensure that you've got, you know, traceability and security because, you know, regardless of whether the work's being done in a national lab or in a university or in a company, there are security current concerns, not least intellectual property, but also, um, you know, nefarious uses and so forth. So, um, yeah, I think there's the, the base tool set for science at scale that we've talked about. That's, that's where we are right now. Um, and, and, and you're right, you know, NIH is still, for all the wonderful things that it does, um, a cottage industry model of individual investigators, small teams and so forth, not you know, synchrotron scale, you know, science uh, by um, large groups that uh, places like the Department of Energy can do, and many companies, Ginkgo, you know, obviously uh, um, uh, really um, a thought leader and a, and a performance leader there. Um, so I got so taken with Chris's um, multi-layered answer. I forgot the question. I can answer it. No, no, it, was designed, it was designed to obfuscate. <laughs> Did no, I answer no, the I, question? I don't know if I answered the question. That's a, that's I a personal problem. I think you uh, answered the question. Go ahead, Dr. Artul. So uh, first of all, the, the, the DOE labs are um, a real national asset that in recent years, I think has been underused. DOE was very instrumental in the Human Genome Project, which people don't realize. And in fact, they're the ones that industrialized much of it. Right. Exactly. They, they figured out, for example, um, how to reduce uh, the use and the production of toxic chemicals as we strove to uh, sequence the human genome for the first time, which has been a long lasting contribution. Um, so not to have them in biology is a little ridiculous. They should be seen as multidisciplinary, national security focused um, um, places um, that do the work long-term and at a moment's notice that the nation needs done, particularly if you need a secure facility. And, and let me just add human, human biology, sorry to interrupt, but it, you know, we do a lot in environmental, but we, excuse me, Department of Energy does a lot in 
environmental biology, but there's this artificial, you know, don't go there in the human side because of, uh, yeah. uh, you know, a departmental and agency equities, which is silly. I'm sorry right. to interject there too. That's right. So what we need to do is put a biologist in charge of DOE and see what happens or as a deputy at DOE. Yeah. But yes, they should go there. I would actually devote a whole national lab to biology yes. if I were me. Okay. Um, but um, let's talk about biosecurity for a moment. For example, I, for, for starters, I hate the word because it means different things to different people. If we're talking about doing biology, whether it's research or production in a way that is safe for the workers and safe for the environment and safe for the public, that kind of biosecurity has yet to be worked out. Um, in my role at DOE, I was supposedly in charge of environment safety and health for the national laboratories. Believe me, I didn't have the authority to do that, but I had the capacity to make a loud noise and um, the problem with creating um, either security or safety regimes for the doing of science is that what you want scientists to do is go to work every day and do something unexpected and unforeseen. And it's very difficult to write regulations against that so sort of work. It just ends up gunking up the works. And what scientists then do is find workarounds to the regulations. I've never met a physicist who read the directions on the box of a new piece of equipment. Okay, the biologists tend to do it more, but the physicists know everything already in my limited experience. So <clears throat> um, what we did work out at DOE and what I think is needed um, for biology is a much more um, is a, is a safety and security regime that actually depends heavily on individual scientists and their colleagues. And every iteration of work ought to be analyzed for the hazards to the doers, to the environment, to the public. A hazard mitigation plan should be filed. It can be a paragraph or it can be a book, depending upon what's going on. Um, and someone has to sign off on that. And then when the experiment is done, you review it and say what worked and what didn't. And you do it again and again and again. And if you don't do it right and you make deliberate or unforced errors, then bad things happen of different sorts. Um, we're never gonna keep up with the pace of science via regulations. Reg the government loves to regulate. It's one of their first impulses given a problem. It takes a long time to regulate and it takes a long time to enforce and a lot of resources. What we need is a best practices regime where we have a centralized body to which we can report accidents and near misses and mishaps as well as best practices. And everybody buys into this and we get better and better and better. That is essentially what the nuclear industry did after Three Mile Island. The penalty was if you didn't buy into the system, you couldn't get insurance and you couldn't operate your plant. We don't have anything like that bi bi biologically yet. But the US government should take the lead in recognizing the power of these technologies as well as their dual use and start to put together a regime that people can begin to trust not to do stupid things. Um, it's still not crystal clear that COVID wasn't the cause, wasn't the result of a lab leak of some kind, probably unintentional. Um, but the, we're going to do a lot of very scary things in the next 25 years with living organisms. And I think people are going to demand a framework of safety and security that they can believe in. And there's also going to be ethical questions that come up. Creating those frameworks and improving them over the time is, a, is an inherently governmental task, but it has to be done in a way that doesn't squelch innovation and that's enforceable. The you know, ongoing bugaboo of the BWC, how do you enforce it? Um. I think you make a series of all excellent points there, and, and thank you. I will take a, a quick moment to plug um, Andrew Hunter's first brief in this series, where he tried to tackle, um, I think successfully, uh, the question of definitions. 
um, of biosecurity because it was one where everyone was kind of proceeding from a slightly different place. Um, I believe the definition he came up with was uh, biosecurity is an integrated approach to assessing and managing risks posed by biological agents and biotechnology to human, animal, and plant life and health. So taking that and pinging back to an earlier question, um, drawing off actually an, an audience question from Greg Sanders, who is a fellow uh, with CSIS, um, who do you think should be the lead on biosecurity? Whether it's an existing uh, department or, or the National Security Council, um, and um, how can how can we designate a lead in a way that helps move those pieces on the chessboard and gives flexibility um, without some of the downsides of the consolidation with the Department of Homeland Security? <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. Ali, tell you, well, you lived that one. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to say. I, I, I have to tell you that the. Um, you know, the impulse always in these situations is to kick it up to the White House. And I'm just not sure that's such a great idea. You know, that's what we do with every problem. You know, let's add a czar to the, to the retinue of uh, czars for this, that, or the other thing. And I'm, I'm just, you know, it, it's not such a great model. It's certainly a, a not a great model to run programs out of, say, the National Security Council. That's not what they are set up to do. They are set up to um, you know, bring together the agencies and provide recommendations that then get implemented. So I would, you know, I do think there needs to be an agency lead, uh, executive uh, agency lead for this sort of thing. But we've tried that again. You know, we thought we had that before the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, all that went out the window and we were, you know, putting together this, that and the other ad hoc uh, um, ad hoc uh, uh, council and, and leadership group and so forth and bypassing the folks whose day job it was to do this stuff in many cases. It, you know, um, so I don't know, Tara, what do you think, Tara? Well, I agree with you that the White House is not the best venue for this. I, I you know, I think- Is it the uh, least worst one though? I don't know, I, you know. <laughs> well, I think- that, Look, I think um, if you look at what's happened thus far historically, the best judges of what's dangerous or might be dangerous are the practitioners. And both the Silimar, which was a uh, conference convened when we first started working with recombinant DNA, convened by scientists on their own initiative, um, and then imposed a, um, a period of, we're not gonna do this while we think about it and see how dangerous it is. And then the uh, conference on gene editing uh, called by the um, academies of science of the US, the UK and China, I think were uh, good um, initial first steps. The way I'd like to see it fall out is leaders from um, scientific research, both public and private sectors call a meeting, frame the meeting, um, and propose something, including an enforcement arm. Um, you know, most people want to do the right thing, okay? Um, they got to get their work done. They have deadlines. They have budget limitations. They have bosses, you know, um, with expectations. Um, but if you make it possible for people to do the right thing, they will try. Now, for some evolutions, we need BSL-4 labs that are engineered to very specific standards. And we should absolutely have a single BSL-4 standard worldwide, okay? And an inspection regime and a test regime. And uh, there ought to be very clear training requirements for going into those buildings and doing stuff. Um, somebody has to convene the meeting. In terms of biosafety, um, uh, I would like to see the science community in all its glory, public and private, at least convene the first meetings and put some ideas down on the table. I don't think, quite frankly, in spite of um, the commitment of people like Chris and others you've had in your program who've been in public service with you know, stellar science backgrounds, I don't think the US government now contains enough people with understanding of how biology is actually happening at the edge to put together such a regime. 
And, you know, the worst possible form of, um, you were looking for worse than best, Chris, the worst possible form of communication is a congressional hearing, <laughs> in my experience. Right. So if we have to go through that methodology of figuring out what we're going to do, it'll take forever and we'll get some kind of strange chimera uh, out of the process. So I would like to see industry and the research, the academic research community together put something down. This is the way we're going to try and govern ourselves as well as, and this is how we want to be called accountable and then get, you know, government and not just the U.S. government right. into the game. Yeah, it has to be replicable across the world. Obviously, we've got a worldwide trend and, and this management model, whatever we come up with uh, for our people in our country needs to dovetail with that. And I, I'm not, it's not clear to me that even that worked particularly well, you know, um, just because of the uh, equities and responsibilities of the agencies as, as they're set up as they're set up now. If I could just draw out a little bit, um, Dr. O'Toole, I know you have a very strong academic background and academia like think tanks is one of those places where you can sometimes get government and industry um, to talk to each other. Do you think there is a role for academia um, in this conversation? Absolutely. They should be part, they should, you know, they should probably convene the um, uh, uh, conversation with help from industry. I mean, they do somewhat different things. Um, so you need, um, I mean, we're talking about as though these were, you know, consistent sectors. Biology still to some extent is a cottage industry. There's lots of bits and pieces. Uh, it's going on all over the place, not just in departments of biology. And um, as a consequence, it's hard to see what's actually going on. Um, certainly from an investment point of view, it's difficult to get a sense of the horizon. But it ought to be academia and industry. And by industry, I mean big pharma as well as these small biotechs together. And if you get a representative sample of five people, you don't want a committee of 50 to start. And you call a meeting and it becomes a bigger meeting and they, you know, you keep going, something will happen. Um, I think that's basically what happened to the nuclear industry after Three Mile Island when they knew they were in trouble. Um, I think um, a lot of regulatory regimes have kind of evolved, particularly in Europe, into more of a conversational exchange before bad things happen, as opposed to government with a big stick waiting for signs that things are amiss. We can't do that in biology. The consequences, you know, are too serious to wait till bad things happen. But I, you know, I'd add that the weight of, you know, in some sense, I mean, there are smart uh, um, physicists in many places, but in some sense, the weight of physics is in our, you know, the big machines for science, the colliders, the synchrotrons, CERN, these are all sort of government, you know, centralized organizations. That's not true for biology, right? The weight of biology, the most cutting edge biology is not inside the government it's in academia and small innovative companies so there's really no no choice but to include those and we did you know we had maybe a little bit of a pipe dream idea uh when when we were working uh the the covid crisis and that is what about a reserve you know call it a reserve corps but boy does that come with all sorts of you know crazy implications the idea that we would socialize people from academia and industry to be able to come together in places like our national labs. And we did have people knocking on the door. How can I help? How can I get involved? How can I come to your, and we didn't have a mechanism for them to do that. So, uh, you know, call it a reserve corps, call it what you will, but the idea that we'd know who is able to help in a biosecurity crisis and maybe even annually or every couple of years exercise them hey, here's the manufacturing crisis. How would we all respond to that? How would we get together to do that? Uh, that's another great idea, you know, that, that we haven't explored, um, but, uh, and, and we could. So I'm all for drills and tabletop exercises. Um, I think they're terrific for raising awareness, particularly among senior leaders who have no idea what a pandemic was. 
um, and uh, for acquainting them with what each agency is supposed to be doing and you know um, uh, what's likely to happen next. I think they're also good at a lower level of seniority operationally for seeing if you really can, for example, get 150 people through the shower outside your ER yeah, right. uh, in 60 minutes. And, you no, know, UPMC did those drills actually, and they were very useful. Um, <clears throat> and it raised the question of what do we do during the winter, um, for example, in <laughs> Pittsburgh, and they solved that problem too. Um, but um, I just want to caution us about um, using the word biosecurity as the first thing that comes to mind when we say biology, because um, we're in a world of trouble right now. It's a, this is part of the revolution, that the nature of our problems has changed. Um, they're greater in magnitude. They're much more consequential. They're going to have effects undo the generations. Um, and they're very, very complex. Biology is the way through, I am convinced. And we're not gonna get there. We're not gonna have the imagination and the will and the um, resilience uh, to get to solutions if people's first instinct on hearing biology is it's dangerous, it's powerful, we need biosecurity, it's a biodefense thing. We have to somehow, <laughs> in the midst of a global pandemic, emphasize the hopefulness that comes with these powers, the, the possibilities that come with understanding how mother nature works at the molecular level. It's a two-edged sword as power always is, but we have to get people to understand that we could figure out how to feed ourselves under you know, increasingly harsh conditions conditions. We can figure out how to drive down carbon emissions uh, and how to not make them so damaging. We, we need to, and scientists in particular, need to talk about the upside and the hopefulness that is inherent in this knowledge about the natural world. And CSIS has to talk about it in ways that go beyond biosecurity I mean, to CSIS, anything that has security in the name is good, um, no matter how dire. But for most people, security means threat. And it's not just about threat. It's also about promise. Well, that's my tasking. Um, and um, thank you very much for a very hopeful note, because I think you're absolutely right that we don't want to get so focused on um, the present challenges before us that we lose the wonder of what the bio biosecurity, bioeconomy, uh, biology revolution can bring us. Um, with that, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us. Um, thank you all in the audience so much for making time in your afternoon. And thank you also to Ginkgo Bioworks and Battelle Memorial uh, for supporting our research on this project. Uh, please do be sure to check out our brief and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Nice to see you both. Stay safe.